Hey guys, this is Savannah from earthandwater.co. I'm here today with a guest, Josh Work, also known as the Emotional Support Viking on TikTok and Instagram. Josh, how Please. are you doing today? Oh, happy to be here. Good about yourself. I'm doing good as well. You want to tell us a little bit about how you got to doing all of this? Because, I mean, you're really, you're starting to gain some traction on TikTok, especially with, a, you know, emotional support, right? Mm-hmm. You're, I, you come in and almost all of your videos are you in this ice bath and you pop up and you give us some kind of motivational speech, tell us we're doing a good job. And then you go back under and it's really touched my heart and on several occasions, I know I've needed to hear that stuff. And, you know, so many of us do need to hear that stuff. We're out here essentially drowning in our own ice bath, but not enjoying it. (laughs) Well, I'm very happy to hear that I've, I've helped you and helped so many others too. Um, I think under some description, I kind of come by it naturally. I've always been the the friend in the group growing up that others would turn to for advice or guidance or anything like that. Uh, the ice baths I started doing about a year ago when the swamp cooler at the restaurant I work at went out for about a week. So I'm the chef there. I was cooking in about 130 degree ambient air temperature, standing awesome. over 350 degree fryer. And I had seen a couple TikToks about the merits of ice baths. So one day I was like, that's enough of that. I'm going to go to Home Depot, get myself a stock take and some ice and got in and got hooked. That's amazing. Yeah, you. I had asked if that was hard because, you know, I've also seen the benefits of taking cold showers and whatnot. And I've been trying to like wean myself off of really hot showers because I've always been a scald me please type of person. And it's it's hard and I asked you if it was hard and you were like no nah, it was a piece of cake but now that I know the whole story I bet it was a piece of cake 130 degrees over a steaming oven or stove top that's pretty rough yeah uh ice bathing in general is definitely the thing you want to kind of ease yourself into obviously I didn't go that route but uh since I've since I've gotten into it it's been wonderful it's come in immensely handy uh, the ice bathing especially is good for treating anxiety and stress. Uh, it's good for the body as well, but the the cognitive benefits have been the biggest thing for me. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you've noticed yourself, like the differences since you started doing that? Well, if we want to get right into it, um, I think one of the biggest things for me is that when I started ice bathing was pretty serendipitous. If you look at someone like Wim Hof, he's kind of the the godfather of ice bathing. And he started doing it. And this is where I should bring up a trigger warning for anybody. We're going to get into some self-harm here. But um, he started ice bathing after he lost his wife to suicide. So I had started ice bathing. And Wim Hof, he describes it when he did it. He was walking through a park one day mourning the loss of his wife. It was during the winter and there was a cold creek running through the park and there was this tickle in the back of his head that told him to get in. So he did. And when he got in, he said that everything else that he was worried about, all the stresses, everything else went away. Because when you're in the ice bath, the only thing you can think about is cold. It erases every other thing that you're dealing with. So for me personally, um, I had started ice bathing just about a year ago to today, and it was a couple of weeks later that one of my good friends, someone that I worked with at the restaurant for the last seven years, decided to end their life as well. And at this point, I was already taking the ice baths. I was feeling some of the benefits, and I, I think being in that cold water helped me to metabolize that loss. And I would like to say that that was the only time that it's happened in the past 12 months, but I know six other people besides him who have decided to make that choice in the last year as well. And wow. whether two others of them were, were good friends, one I grew up with, one I worked with for a number of years as well. Others were people in the community and I live in a, a small mountain town. Everyone knows each other. Everyone knows everybody's business. But I think being in the ice bath helped me personally to kind of deal with some of that stress. And on the back end of it, I wanted to kind of process my own grief and do something positive with it. 
and be able to hold the space in a platform where people can drop by for, you know, just a little bit of positivity, positivity, something silly. If you need to talk, by all means, please reach out and help. Um, I'm here to help. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You know, we we just met each other and people so often they want to skirt around the deep stuff. And, you know, which is the reason that I do podcasts in, in, anyway, because it's so hard to find people in your day to day life for most of us anyway, not all of us <clears throat> who we can have these serious, real conversations with because, you know, people are uncomfortable with emotions not only sharing their own, but allowing others the space to share theirs. So I really appreciate you sharing with us because that's, that's deep. You know, yep. we all have experienced loss at some point. So that's something that all of us can take something away from. Maybe we can try an ice bath next time. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it can be hard to open up, especially to people that, you know well, um, I can attest to that personally. So sometimes having a friendly stranger that's hanging out in a nice bath, maybe he's got in his beard, uh, that can add a little levity, make it a little easier. It's a little less personal, but it gets the ball rolling. Absolutely. You know, I've noticed that too. It's sometimes easier to talk to a stranger about serious things that you would never talk to your closest loved ones about, mm -hmm. especially if it involves them. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the most difficult of all <laughs> yeah no we um my whole goal here with the podcast is to help people heal because the world you know there's no secret we have a lot of issues in the world and the invention of the internet is so recent that on one hand most of us don't remember the world before it on the other hand, it's a brand new world where we're finally able to communicate with everybody and see everybody's stories. You know, I know I, for one, felt ridiculously alone before the internet came about. And then as soon as I was able to, I just shut myself off into my computer for years and years and years. And that's probably what saved me from making one of those decisions as well that so many have. Yeah, I'm a. I think we're probably thereabouts in the same the same age range. Uh, I was briefly around before the internet became a thing. Right. I, rem I remember my parents getting. I think it was the Mac OS back then. My brother had worked for a computer company, and he got my parents a computer, got them set up with dial up internet, and we had the old school AOL with that little key ring and a lightning bolt that would go into it, and yep. that got sound. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say much the same. I was briefly around before the internet came about. And then likewise, about the time I was in middle school, I got set up with MySpace and Facebook and mm. kind of dived into it deep for a couple of years, took a couple of years off. And now I'm kind of straddling this line where I, I want to engage in it because that's the way that humans interact so much these days. But I think it's also healthy to have uh, life outside of that as well. Yeah. You still... Go ahead. Oh, go on. <laughs> I was just going to prompt you to keep going because uh, I've seen that you spend a lot of time outdoors. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I, I like to keep in mind in regards to the internet is something that Kurt Vonnegut brought up in his book, Slapstick, which wasn't one of his favorite books. I personally adore it. But he says that when two people argue, what they're saying is you're not enough people. We're a uh, a tribal social sort of animal that was evolved to live in family groups of 50 or so people. So if you were having a hardship, there was some elder nearby that you could rely on that not only knew you and your life story, but had pertinent information that they could relate to you in order to help you. Now we live in a day and age where our tribe is 8 billion people and the internet is on the one hand, it's a it's a great way to get together with people and interact holistically. And on the other end, it can be very isolating if you end up going down a rabbit hole and isolating yourself from others for too long. I think being able to come together cohesively and understand that, you know, there is no us and them. We're all on team human mm -hmm. and holistically is going to be the one of the best things that we can do for our own mental health and stability. Absolutely. I was talking to a friend about that two days ago because, um, you know, a lot of conversation is a one-way street these days, I've noticed. 
and which is something I've dealt with my entire life on one hand I got better with it for a little bit because I did start finding a couple of people here and there who would listen and it would be like a two-way street and then here lately it's been I'm an active listener and people innately notice that and like that whether they're aware of that's what that is so people emotional dump on me all the time which I don't mind you know I'm here for it um you know I've built this whole platform on yes let me help you yes like I get it out let's let's find something that'll work um but I have a hard time finding someone that will help me in that same way when I need it right And uh, I was talking to her about how we used to live in a village, you know, you had 50 to 100 people to navigate your entire life. And that was it. Like you had those 50 to 100 people that you were interacting with on a daily basis who saw what you were doing every day and figuring out how to build a relationship with them was a little bit easier. Because like you said, if you were having issues with this person, there's 50 more around that you can go over there and like get it off your chest and see what they feel about it and see if you can find common ground and then come back. But um, these days, I think everybody is so overwhelmed with the amount of people that they have to try and figure out and navigate that a lot of them just shut down. Yeah, I would say that scale of 50 to a hundred people is probably the amount that we've evolved to be able to handle with. Mm-hmm. And now that, like I said, 8 billion. So mm-hmm. our brains, there's probably a little bit of a lag time. We're probably all on a little bit of buffering as we're, we're growing, you know, uh, the only change that's constant, we're not done evolving. We're now st- stretched into an area where we have to evolve socially and doing that together. Um, active listening is an important component of that. I've heard it said that oftentimes people only listen until it's their turn to speak again instead yeah. of listening to respond. So actively engaging with each other, holding space for each other to have that cohesive dialogue where we can come together and find some common ground and learning new methods of evolving humanity, I guess. Yeah, we just got to get there, you know, um, and which comes back to the healing thing. The reason, you know, everybody's overwhelmed and active listening, you know, oh my gosh, so many social skills that aren't taught in school, aren't taught anywhere, and which all comes back to uh, children, essentially. Uh, I could go on forever and I don't know where to start. <laughs> Let's begin. <laughs> yeah. um, the world, you know, we've come to the place where we're at with the world and it's not a great place and we're all waking up to it because of the internet and the ability to see outside of our little bubble. Because again, you know, your mindset, your belief system, your view of the world and how you've constructed it in your mind to be, because everyone lives in their own little world, um, was completely dependent on those 50 to 100 people and what they knew. And that was all you had to go off and base your view of the world upon. And now we have expanded so quickly, which is great, which is great. So now we're seeing that um, we have a lot of healing to do as a society, which comes back to healing the individual, which comes back to healing the inner child. Because each one of us was a child who, you know, either had their needs met or had their needs not met. And most of us, the the children who had their needs not met are the majority. Um, and I'm not saying like they didn't have food and shelter. I'm saying like that's probably that might have been all they had. Right? But as a society, we've historically shooed children away. Shoo shoo, let the adults talk you know, go play. Um, Oh, toughen up. Gosh, you cry and whine about everything. Um, You know, all of the things that we've all heard, uh, rushing us through our stories, um, spit it out, let's go. You know, we've all heard all of these things, right? And um, some kids don't pay any attention to it. And they go on and they grow up and they, they do just fine. But so many internalize that. Um, And then they turn into adults, but they're not actually adults. They're still children, but in adult bodies. And now they have responsibilities. 
And then they have, you know, it's their job to formulate the world and make laws and regulations for people. And, you know, it ends up being a little problematic because you don't, you can't have children unhealthy, like with unhealthy mindsets and trauma that they're still processing and running over in their head that dictates how they treat others and how they believe the world's supposed to work or does work. And, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, <laughs> well, my background is in philosophy. So forgive me if I, if I get a little esoteric or long-winded here. No. Uh, well, yeah. well, for myself personally, I think healing society, healing the individual, healing the inner child. Um, I think it almost needs to start with the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my favorite philosophers are Edmund Husserl, Martin Heidegger, phenomenologists that were involved in states of being. And if you're going to have an authentic state of being towards yourself, you have to have an authentic state of being towards your past. You've grown up in a culture scape, which I'm borrowing from one of your previous episodes, but we've all grown up and messed in this culture scape where there's all these preconditions, things that we're taught that we should do, should not do. We should be this way. We should be that way. And that has helped formulate the way that we view and see the world. And there are undoubtedly traumas back there for most of us, myself personally as well. Sure. But if we can adhere to those traumas and find it within ourselves to process them, heal them, understanding that they are an essential component of our being. Everything that has happened to us has shaped us. Like we're, we're more than our trauma, we're more than our experiences, but those hold weight into who we are now. So as I am now, I really love and enjoy the person that I've grown up to be. There's things in my past that I wish hadn't happened, things that I wish had happened differently, but if they had happened any other way than the way that they did, I would be to one degree or another, possibly a very radically different human being than the one I am today. So I have to hold that for what it's worth and carry that into the present and then proceed into the future. And into the future is where we look at healing the other. You heal yourself and then you give that love, that healing that you have to offer to the society at whole, if you have it within you or can, can reach that sort of audience. But if we start gaining numbers little by little, sooner or later, job's done. We tip the scale. Yeah. Do you remember, like, have, you feel like you've always been in the same pretty well, like, yeah, that happened, but I'm going to move forward. Or because I know for me, I was very stuck in my trauma for a very long time. And I was very angry and very like it consumed my entire being. And all I could do was sit around and think about it and wonder why did that happen the way it did? And why did they do that? And why couldn't like, why me? And, you know, and I had to work my way out of that into the mindset that you're talking to right now. Yes, you absolutely. I would agree. Um, let's get a little vulnerable here. So my biggest sticking point with my trauma that I've had in the past is that I was sexually assaulted when I was 13. I was at a friend's sleepover and his dad had been going through a divorce for the last couple of years. He had had, he'd had a rough time, but he was out there. He was dating again. And I went over for a sleepover at my friend's house. His dad works nights. So he left and his girlfriend stayed and watched us and went to bed. We stayed up, played video games. We watched cartoons. I fell asleep at some point and my friend went upstairs to go to bed. And at some point in the night, uh, the girlfriend who had been a recovering addict had decided to start drinking and came downstairs to get another beer. And I had something that she wanted. So she took it. And I, being aware of culture scapes, where we come from, I'm a 13 year old boy who's grown up in the United States. I've seen American Pie. Everyone has told me this is something that you should want. You know, boys can't get raped. This shouldn't be a problem. But I'm terrified and just sick to my stomach while it's happening. I don't know how to understand what's happening. I haven't even had my first kiss yet. And when she was done, she told me that if I told anyone, it would ruin my life. And if she found out that I told anyone, she would make me regret it. 
So I laid awake the rest of the night and in the morning I called my parents to come and pick me up and they asked if anything was wrong because normally I'd hang out until the afternoon. They'd have to drag me away to go back home, but I just told them I wanted to come home. Everything was fine. And I bottled that up for a long time because I didn't have the life experience to understand what had happened to me. I didn't know how to move forward from it. Like you talk about trauma happening in your childhood in a lot of ways, when the trauma happens, you get stunted there for a long time. Absolutely. And so my friends would come to me for dating advice and I haven't even started dating yet. I'm holding on to all of this trauma myself, but I can speak to them. I can speak to their partner and being able to kind of be of service to other people was how I started to cathart some stuff. Um, but personally, anytime I would be in an intimate situation with, with another I would have that same sense of stale Chinese food and old beer just flood my nostrils again and I'd freak out. And it wasn't until my 20s when I finally opened up and told somebody that that had happened that I was able to progress a little bit. I was able to date and maintain a relationship like I hadn't hadn't been able to do for the better part of a decade. And it was about that time that I found out that my abuser had passed away. And the first thought that I had was good. And the second thought I had was that that was a human being that had hurt me, sure, but I shouldn't be wishing ill on this other person. And it was at that time that I decided it was time to tell my parents about it. And, you know, I'm the only member of my family that's not from the South. My dad's side of the family is from Texas. My mom's side is from Arkansas. She's a strong Southern woman. She's sweet as can be. But if you mess with her baby, she'll fry green tomatoes you real quick. Um, so she wanted to go out for blood. She wanted retribution. And that it was in being able to explain to her that this thing had happened to me. It was over. It was done. It was in the past. There was nothing that we could do about it. The best thing to do was to let it go and not let it, you know, fester and rot and, and poison us any further because it does it doesn't matter. It's done. It's done. And getting her to let it go helped me to let it go. And af after that, I was able to go about life more normally. I still had some some learning to do, um, some some coping mechanisms that I still needed to work on. But over time, I was able to to sort it all out. And now I've got I've got a wife, I've got a stepson, I've got a whole big family, I've got a life here that's wonderful. But it did take honestly probably about 15, 20 years to to work through everything. Absolutely. And even now is is difficult. But I think that's one of the things that is good about vulnerability is if you can can pry it open and share it with someone else, the burden shared is lighter. And I've definitely never shared that experience to this wide of an audience, but here we are today learning and growing together. Well, we appreciate it completely. The, I'm, I'm glad I could create a safe place for you to be able to share that because that is some very big things. And that's what I'm trying to do as well. I figure if, if we can, if we can share with each other and that encourages other people to share and, you know, the cliche sharing is caring, but it really truly is. Absolutely. So many people, because it, you know, it's not just our culture, it is other cultures, but as, speaking as an American, you know, I can't really speak a whole lot for other countries that I haven't even visited, but, you know, I know a little bit, but yeah, it's very rampant still, and people still want to hush it. They want to, shh, sh that didn't happen, or come on, please, you're making that up, or, you know, these are all things I've heard, and mm -hmm. it's, more people have experienced abuse, sexual abuse than haven't. And we're finally, healing is messy and healing as a society is loud and messy. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's how we come up with like the Me Too movement and amongst other things, the, um, even the LGBTQ stuff, you know, in the news is still part of that sexual healing that we're trying to do as a society so that we can are you familiar with the chakra system yeah okay cool so you know root chakra that's our first one that's all about um 
stability, having your basic needs met, your food, shelter, all of that, which for the most part, definitely not everybody, nothing's universal, everything's relative, but for the most part, we've kind of, we've met that as a society, and that's what we've been trying to do for the past, like, several hundred years. Um, Now, we're moving into healing the sacral stuff, which is the sexual stuff, and it's uncomfortable, especially in a country founded by Puritans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one of the biggest things that has been personally beneficial to me is that anything worth doing was never easy. Yeah. Healing inherently messy, especially if we want to talk about healing the society, but having that that root chakra met, those basic needs met, like a plant, we're growing. We're not we're not yet ready to flower. We're just a little sprout. Gosh, we uh, are so small, so tiny yeah. in, in that scheme of things. Yeah. Even on the the scan the the scale of human history, the United States is is brand new. Yeah. On the scale of geologic history, humans have been here for a fraction of a second. Mm-hmm. We are still learning and growing. We are far from done. There is so much further that we can go and that we can do. And I'm excited to see the changes that we can make. It's going to be ugly at times, but oh, yeah. that's the nature of the beast. It is. And, you know, we're getting a little bit better every day. But it, yeah, it's insane how how new people don't realize we actually are because, you know, people's egos kind of get up in there and, uh, you know, it, it makes them hard to... Uh, see and hear and listen they don't want to because they think that they know you know they think that we all know you know they they want to be like ah, just i don't know why this is popping up in my head specifically but i hear a lot ah the government would never eh, are you sure <laughs> you know and that's just part of that that newness because yeah as a society we're essentially children and we're just trusting i guess that's one of my other favorite things from Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, you know, every hundred years, all new people, all of us just got here. We're all just children walking each other home. And I think we tend to get a little narcissistic, perhaps at times. We think that we are the end all be all. But if you look at the perspective of another, not even a, a human being, uh, for example, there's this book, Ishmael, who I'm blanking on the author's name right now. But in there, he has a parable where someone interviews a jellyfish about the creation of the universe. And it's highly biblical. On the first day, God creates or says, let there be light and runs through the days. And then on the seventh day, God created the jellyfish and everything was perfect. It's important to be aware of our state, where we are individually, and then encompass that also where we are socially and always have a a scope of the big picture. It's nice to zero in, but, you know, uh, what is it? Think globally, act locally, make the little changes that you can, even in your, your day-to-day life, be an active member of your community, help, help your neighbor out if you can and get that momentum going. Yes. There's an Icelandic proverb that says, even though you travel slowly, you you will arrive at your destination. As long as we, we keep going. Progress is progress. If you take two steps forward, one step back, you still made one step forward. Like my mom always said, if you fall down seven times, stand up eight. Absolutely. Things take so much longer than people think they do. And they want to give up after that, you know, they're not seeing, I, I preach that all the time in uh, my yoga classes because I teach yoga in real life and uh, which is kind of a branch of this. It all goes together. I don't know, mm-hmm. I, but you know, you can't watch a flower bloom. You can't watch a tree grow, but you know, it doesn't look like it moves at all day to day, but then you walk out one day and there it is. We are the same way. You know, we're fancy houseplants. People keep saying that. People don't understand how deeply that is true. Um, are you familiar with Naruto at all? Uh, a little bit. I do the Naruto run around the house for my wife. <laughs> yeah. I'll let my geek side out for a second. Um, so, you know, essentially it's grown-up ninjas mm-hmm. caring for baby ninjas and teaching them how to be a ninja while bad things are coming left and right. Um, but the overall plot of the story is that everything is for the village, which translates into everything is for the children because the children are the future. And so, yeah, I, I talk about all the time about how, um, because, you know, I have people in my life who have, they're very angry. They're very, um, you know, 
we were talking earlier about how trauma hits you as a child and then you get stuck there in that mindset, in that mentality, you're never able to progress into adulthood because you were too busy trying to figure that out. So they come out, like they're very angry. They're very, um, what about me crying about me? And I'm like, I I hear you. I see you. Um, at the same time, we have to figure out a way to progress from that to the children in your life that you are damaging (laughs) because, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, and, and I, I can never find the words to get through to them that, um, because I try to tell them, you know, we don't, we matter, but we don't matter. It's all about the children. They matter. And, you know, like that doesn't translate well to someone who is still stuck in their trauma from 15, 20 years ago, who is for all intents and purposes, a child themselves on the inside. They're just, you know, in an adult body. So Mm -hmm. they just blow up more and they're like, but I do matter. And they were wrong and they shouldn't have. And I'm like, I understand all of that. What you don't see is that you were taking all of that and putting it on the children in your life instead of recognizing that your adults didn't care for you the way they should have. So, you know, we need to take that and instead be the adults for the children in our lives that we should have had. Yeah, it's all about upsetting the the cycle of per, 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 oh, wait, hang on. Where's my words? I'm going to have a sip of tea real quick. What are you drinking? What kind of tea? I am drinking black tea with a little bit of honey from my beehives. Mm. Are there benefits with for that? I mean, of course, there's benefits to that, but are there any specifically or you just like to drink it? Oh, I just like to drink it. Though it's worth noting that uh, beekeepers do have the longest life expectancy of any occupation known to man. Absolutely. It's something about like the buzzing vibrations that you're around all the time and probably the honey that you're actually consuming a lot of too. Yeah, the honey's very good for allergies, especially, which is mm-hmm. how I kind of first started getting into bees, I guess. My uh, my grandfather had been a beekeeper and a winemaker. I started eating honey because I had just terrible allergies as a boy. So the more local, the better, was able to overcome that. And the bee stings themselves were actually really good for arthritic or arthritis, arthritic pain and stuff. Anytime I get stung, it hurts for about an hour. And then the rest of the day, my finger is just titanium. Wow. But I, th- I think the beekeeping also speaks to what you were saying is that we have to think of ourselves as a hive, so yes. to speak. There is no, there are individual bees, but the bee isn't the organism. Bees are considered a super organism. Mm. It's not the bee that reproduces, it's the colony that reproduces. The queen is kind of the control center. You have your workers, you have your drones, which help propagate the or the colony. But if one individual bee is stuck in its beingness and not able to contribute to the social whole, that damages the overall health of the hive. Exactly. So take yourself, which everyone has to do in their own time. There's a conception and philosophy that is founded or pr- originates from ancient Greece. There's, there's two gods of time. There's Kronos and Kairos. Mm-hmm. There's chronological time, which is what we're the most familiar with. Today is May 23rd, 2023. You know, tomorrow is going to be this day. But chirological time is more on the scale of a banana. If you ask, when is a banana going to be ripe? You can't say it's going to be ripe on Tuesday. It might be ripe on Tuesday, but it might be ripe on Wednesday. The banana is going to be ripe when it's ripe. And when somebody is willing or ready to make that change to themselves, that's when it will turn over. Um, Another useful saying that has stuck with me through the years uh, in my philosophy classes, I used to take copious notes, but I would also write little anecdotes that other students had said in class that I thought were funny. One of them that has stuck with me is you can lead a horse to water, but you've got to be really strong to drown it. You can't force anybody to make that change themselves, but you can lead by your own positive example. And hopefully over time, you can maybe get someone to that point. And while you're doing that, you're also got to be thinking about future generations. Mm. Like myself, my son is my stepson. I didn't meet him until he was 13. I missed the the diaper and all the cute little tiny game stage. I, I walked into a teenager, but it has been one of the greatest thrills of my life for the past eight years to be an example to this young man of what kind of man to be 
and I've seen a lot of growth in him. He reminds me a lot of myself when I was his age, which has been really, really cool to see him grow up. But it's always being, I don't even want to say self selfless because helping others helps you as well. Like it's a mutually beneficial, sustainable system. If you can have the right viewpoint and wherewithal to see it through to perpetuity, knowing that it will outlast you. Mm. Like the saying, you're sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree long ago. The good that we do in the world today, we're never going to see all of it come to fruition. That's for someone else. But it's having that ability to understand that we are part of something greater than ourselves that is going to outlast us and benefit someone who we don't even know yet. Absolutely. Or maybe never. Yeah. Yeah. I used to, like I said earlier, I used to be a very angry individual. And uh, like, I was a very angry teenager. There you go. A teenager in early 20s. I was very angry. Um, couldn't get anybody in my life to like hear me, see me, look at me. You know what I mean? So I was just trying to like, force them to and then at some point something just clicked in my head that uh yeah the only thing you can do is lead by example and show them a better way of doing being acting speaking listening all of that and um I know one story when I first started doing anything online because uh I carried uh you know because you know we started out before the internet and so I carried notebooks around with me 24 seven. And I was always doodling and jotting down words and inspirational things and just, you know, whatever, whatever. So that naturally progressed into my blog that mm -hmm. I started. And, um, you know, I'm very, uh, business oriented in my mind. And so my schedule is my schedule. And if I want it to work, I have to treat it like a job. And, my parents one day showed up and just showed up one night and were like, Hey, we're going to the beach tomorrow and we have an extra room. Do you want to go? And I was like, okay, sure. So we packed up and left, but I had these, uh, I had these blog posts that were scheduled to go out and I had to get them out because like for no other reason than just a schedule I had created in my head. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my son at the time was not even a year old. I think he was like six months old. And we were in the condo and everybody, it was like rainy or something. And everybody was watching football, just laying around on the couch. I, he, I was working on my computer trying to get this out. And my son was crying. He was fine. He, he was, he just wanted to be held. He was a baby that you had, we had to hold him from the moment he was born until he was about two or he would <laughs> cry. And he's still very emotional, very melty, and very cuddly. He just needs to be cuddled 24-7. And um, I've always been a very, uh, it's not the mother's job to do everything for the kid. You know, it takes a, vi it takes a village. I was, not I was not neglectful at all, but my dad got really upset. I was on the computer and I was ignoring him because there are five other people doing nothing that see me doing something, somebody will get him, you know? And, um, well, he jumps up and he turns around and he goes, what are you doing on that computer anyway? And in an effort to calm and make light of the situation, I went, I'm trying to change the world. Yeah. That didn't go over well. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he went on this whole rant about how, regular people like that's the dumbest thing he's ever heard regular people can't change the world people like us can't do anything about nothing um you have to be born into money your family has to be into politics you have to something 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 right and I just remember him being angry and me just being just struck by it because mm -hmm. I was like he actually believes that he believes that he's small and that he can't do anything and that he is at the mercy of everything and everybody else around him. And so that's kind of like what ki really kicked me in gear to, um, you know, try to change, show him. And I'm not like, I don't know, on one hand, the only people who c have ever changed the world are the ones that were crazy enough to think that they could. On mm -hmm. the other hand, I am practical and I understand that that's a big job. And, uh, but yeah, you focus on it. You think globally, but you act locally. So I've been trying to get focused on the community.
and try to preach that, you know, like farmers markets and beekeeping and grow your own food. Yeah, that reminds me of there's another proverb that uh, I remember there's a boy on a beach and there's a whole bunch of starfish that have walked on the beach and the boy is walking down the beach, picking up starfish and chucking them back into the ocean. And his father sees him doing this and comes out to tell him, hey, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm trying to save all these starfish. And the father points out, but there's so many starfish. There's no way you can you can possibly make a difference. You're only a small child. How are you going to do this? And the boy picks the starfish up, chucks it back into the ocean and says, made a difference for that one. Having the, the viewpoint that you can change the world is very powerful. Um, the fear that we can't, I think, is where we get limited sometimes. Because anything perceived as real is real in its consequences. Mm -hmm. So if we think that we're inconsequential and we can't make a difference, we never will. Mm -hmm. If we think that someone who disagrees with us politically, religiously, ideologically in some way, if we regard them as different and count them as an enemy, then we have made them an enemy to ourselves. And that's going to control how we react to these people in the future. So there's these little mental minutiae that we need to try to unravel little by little as best we can. And I think the precognizance to be aware of that, you know, just, just a little bit of awareness. If we can spark a touch of awareness in people that this exists and is a thing and could be a thing that you could undo in yourself and benefit others, that's how you get the ball rolling. Absolutely. Awareness is the absolute bottom line key to it all. Just being aware of your thoughts, your beliefs, your words, your actions, and asking yourself, you know, does that align with what I want? Does that align with who I feel like I am, who I want to be? You know, you, you can all day long be like, well, that's how I was raised. Okay, but is that how you wanted to be raised? Is that something you want to perpetuate? Yeah, yeah. Is that how you want to raise the future? Because that's how it that's all is. One of the things that I like about food, like you brought up Naruto, my my nerd kingdom is is food. I've been in the restaurant industry for the last 15 years. And one of the things that I like about food is that really good food has always come from hardship. It's been people that didn't have a lot that they could bring together and they managed to meld it almost alchemically into something beautiful. You know, think sausages. It's leftover parts of an animal, but it could be expressed so beautifully. Um, on the flip side of that, you have whole roasted animals, which is something that we've done here in the U.S. a lot. We've always been pretty well off. So we've got steak, burgers, pizza. We got big food and lots of it. We haven't had to culturally craft these exquisite meals that have come from simple origins, but have expressed themselves beautifully. And I think... The next step beyond that is that food is a great way of breaking down borders. If you sit down and break bed with someone from a different culture, different society, someone who thinks differently than you, but you sit down, break bread together, have a meal, you start talking, you see people are pretty much the same everywhere. We all have the same fears, wants, hopes, dreams, aspirations. We want to have enough food on our table. We want our loved ones to be cared for we're all quintessentially the same. The foods that we eat might be different. The ways that we think might be different, but we are, we are one in the same. Absolutely. We're big foodies too over here. My husband does a lot of cooking, a lot of grilling, a <laughs> lot of smoking. Yeah. I'm the chef in the family, but my wife is the best cook I've ever known. Oh, wow. That's so nice. We, um, I've tried for years and years and years and years and years to, I, you know, some people, have talents towards things and some people can cultivate talents towards things and some people can learn that man I have studied trying to cook for years and I still burn cereal mm -hmm. I uh that's much how I feel the same about baking my mom was a, a baker by trade she baked for 40 years and baking is a lot more like chemistry it's very scientific and cooking, I can understand how flavors mix together and throw a little bit of this to counteract that. This is too salty. Let's add some acid. Boom, 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 boom. That I get. But that quarter teaspoon that I've got to put into a cinnamon roll dough to make it just right breaks my brain every single time. <laughs> yeah. And it makes no sense. My husband's always like, how did you mess this up? 
did you follow the recipe? I'm like, yeah, I did. I did. I read it three times. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. Which has created all of its own problems that we could probably do a whole episode. We could do a whole episode on food, honestly. If you have me back for food, I got you. <laughs> all right, cool. Because, you know, there's a lot of uh, emotional healing trauma type of stuff that goes with food as well. Everybody. Especially your child, if you want to recreate something, that's one of the things about really good food is it always harkens back to a memory that we have. Mm. It could be a memory that we're creating, but if you look at like the movie Ratatouille, his Ratatouille tasted so good because it was made from the cookbook that his mother writ well, while he was a child. Good food calls us back to a state perhaps before we suffer some sort of trauma. Maybe that's why we become aversive to a particular food for some time. But if we're able to go back and have an olfactory experience about our childhood in a correlation to something good, then perhaps we can use that as a template to unravel the bad that was done in the meantime. And I think looking to that trauma, another quote that stands out to me is you can't understand the darkness by flooding it with light. Shadow work is not for the meek. You have to sit in there and understand it, but the light has to grow out of it. You can't force it into it. It has to come from within. Like the root chakra, that seed's got to sprout, put some roots down, and then we can start growing up. Absolutely. People are, yeah, yeah. Shadow work is what it takes to really move through all of this stuff. You can't, because you know, then we get into a toxic pos positivity. Where you're mm -hmm. just uh, shoving it down, shoving it down, piling happiness on top of it. Rainbows, unicorns. Nope, not looking at the rest of it. Good, I'm fine and nothing's wrong forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but it's always still going to be there. But yeah, people, people are afraid of that. I was talking to my aunt the other day about my yoga classes and how it's really hard to, because yoga has become an exercise for a lot of people and because they look at it as an exercise for one a lot of people don't want to put the work towards that at all and then for two the people who do want to put the work towards that would rather spend their hour on the treadmill or lifting weights or something that they feel is more productive because it's the yin and the yang right and yang our, our society is very yang oriented you know they focus on the hustle and they they reward the hustle and go, go, go and do, do, do. And how productive can you be? So what I teach is uh, more of the philosophy side of things. It's more of a yin yoga. It's yin restorative. So we sit in the pose. Most, most of our poses are done on the floor, either sitting or laying down. And we hold them for about two minutes, give or take, to let our body adjust. Like lots of reasons. But in that time, I'm guiding people through breathing exercises and relaxing techniques and posture and alignment and all of these internal workings. And my aunt was like, uh, people don't like that because people don't want to sit with their thoughts. You're, you're, you're letting them, you're giving them space to be able to sit with their thoughts and work through their things, which is exactly what everyone needs to do uh, to heal but it's also hard and uncomfortable and scary even at times. I made a TikTok about that just the other day. It's okay. better to live a, a cruel truth than a comfortable delusion. And oftentimes people don't want to be told the truth because the truth will destroy their illusions. Mm -hmm. But we're quote unquote happy because we're spending all of our time not sitting with our thoughts, avoiding our thoughts, hiding from our thoughts. I think the argument can be made that that's not happiness at all. That's just ambivalence at best and looking at it internally, personalizing it for yourself and understanding that. And then growing out of that is where you can come to an authentic, authentic state of happiness. But sitting with your thoughts is oftentimes uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. and, but that's how you really figure it. Learning how to hang out with just yourself is how you find true self-love and appreciation yep. for who you are and who you have become and everything you've endured and everything that you're going to do and want to do and you figure out your goals and what you want and it's just beautiful if you can just get past the discomfort and, you know, stretching's the same thing in yoga you know people it's painful at first to even sit in the floor and then you start trying to reach your toes and you're like oh I don't know, this is, it hurts this, yeah 
But once you, you keep doing it and you keep doing it, it gets a little bit easier and it gets so easy to the point to where you literally crave that stretch. That's much the same for me in my ice bath. I obviously <clears throat> have a fondness for getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, the more damage we can do to our comfort zone, the better we are as individuals and as people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the more you can grow, the bigger things you can have and do and be, you know, it's all about being, it's being, finding comfort in the discomfort, for sure. Mm -hmm. People all the time, they're like, how do you get up on stage and talk? And I'm like, well, I, one day I realized that nobody wanted to, but I also realized that somebody needed to, because the people who already were, weren't in the right place, vibrationally, or like, intentionally. So, it Somebody got to do it. Yeah. Somebody's got to do it. I've got the right state of mind for it. So might as well. <laughs> and most of it is just showing up. Literally. Mm -hmm. just showing up. Like I, um, you know, we, I don't know if we had started recording yet or not, but when I told you this, but um, this is the first episode I've ever hosted on a podcast. I've done podcasts for years and years and years, you know, being a guest is really no big deal to me at this point. I just show up and follow their lead, but as a host, you have to take the lead. And man, I am only just now getting comfortable with this. I have <laughs> sweated and shook the from we started, but you know, <laughs> and that's just how it is. It's going to be uncomfortable at first, always, no matter what it is. It's going to be uncomfortable at first. Well, it's funny that you mentioned show up. Um, Kyle Cease, he's an actor and comedian. He also does a lot of motivational speaking. And uh, one of my best friends, she's practically my sister, her and her little brother have gone to see him uh, give his motivational talks a couple different times now. And the second time they went and saw him, uh, my friend Christian was lucky enough to be in the elevator while he was walking, while he was going up. And he just turned to him and was like, hey, Kyle. And this guy from years before was like, oh, hey, Christian, what's up, man? How's it going? So he <clears throat> had the cognizance to remember this guy from years apart, which I think is just a cool story. Absolutely. One of the big things that he talked about that particular time was showing up, you know, the, the cliche that we miss a hundred percent of the opportunities that we don't show up for. The most important thing is to just show up leap and the world will throw you a net. And Vonnegut talks about that as well. Like we're all constantly jumping off of cliffs and working on our wings on the way down. Yeah. It's not, be comfortable but it's the only way to do things winging it is exactly my philosophy for everything like i i don't play you know people yeah i've been on a lot of po podcasts i've some people just they jump in and run with it and that's the type of person i've always been to uh other people they write out a whole script and <laughs> they will they will interrupt your thought to move on to the next bullet point in their script and it's like man <laughs> but I think winging it is a lot better because um it's authentic you mm -hmm. know we're we're all we're all lost I was telling my son the other day I was like look because he's brilliant he's too smart for his own good but I was like look you're only level eight I'm level 32 I only just now became a grown-up nobody knows what they're doing ever <laughs> and that's the thing like you see people on TV, you see people um, in politics doing this, doing that, whatever. Uh, they look like they have all of their life together. People on social media, you know, people everywhere. They look like they have their life together. Literally nobody completely has everything together. We are all just building our wings on the way down like, and trying and hoping that we get it done fast enough before we hit the ground. I think that maybe is the point where you you progress into adulthood is that understanding that nobody knows what they're doing. And we're all just trying doing our best to act like we know what we're doing. Yep. But like you said, authenticity, I think winging it, not having a plan that opens you up to a whole bunch of different other experiences. If you, you have a, a roadmap and you're planning on driving from point A to point B and you want to take this straight line, you're going to get where you where you want to go. But maybe there's this really cool point over here that you want to drive off and take a tangent to. And then you end up meeting somebody else and having this interesting conversation. And you have to remain open to all the experiences that life has to give you. And for myself personally, trust that the ones you're getting are the ones that you're meant to have. Absolutely. Well, this has been great. 
I really appreciate you spending this hour to talk with us about all of this. And I, I know we've, we've done some good here. Um, would you like to tell people where they can find you? Would you like to leave anyone with, leave everybody with a last piece of advice? If you could give a piece of advice or encouragement or whatever to the whole world, what would it be? It would be to keep trying. Like no matter where you're at, no matter where you're going, if you're showing up today, if you're doing your dead level best to continue, progress is progress. You're not going to get there overnight and it, you're not going to always be able to stay there. Um, like I think what I talk about a lot with the mental health is that mental health is not an area that you get to get to one day and then your work is over. Yeah. It's constant maintenance. You're always going to be having to look out for it and maintain it. Your work is never done but the work is enjoyable. Absolutely. The only constant is change. Mm -hmm. The only sentence that is always true through all times in history is this too shall pass. Everything ends. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, would you like to share where people can find you? And I'll link it below, of course. But... Uh, I think it's just TikTok. Hi, hi, Thea. This is my dog. This is our youngest. She's a Newfoundland, Irish Wolfhound, Bloodhound, Pyrenees mix. She turns two next Monday. Oh, I, just, I love big dogs. Yeah, she's a nice baby. Uh, but yeah, I can be found on TikTok. That's emotional support Viking periods between the words. I'm in my ice bath. I'm taking recordings of water and stuff. There's lots more of these big dogs and cats and bees and chickens and everything else I got going and on here. bears. I saw you chasing a bear. I chased a bear away just last night. <laughs> Where exactly are you located? I'm in Evergreen, Colorado. Colorado. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Where I grew up road and I strangely enough grew up chasing bears because I've seen a couple of times where out of towners would move here, see a bear, not know how to deal with it. It's getting in their trash can. They overreact and shoot it. Oh. So started chasing bears to try to give them a healthy fear of people so they don't have to get shot like that. Yeah. Uh, so far I've only been charged once, but I've chased I've chased many bears in my day super cool and you can see all of that on his tiktok mm -hmm. all right well thank That's you fine. well thank you for having me thank you for being here and we'll talk to you later